So we come up with this harebrained idea that we're going to go with a, a relatively small team. We don't use any oxygen. We don't use any Sherpa. We don't use any drugs. We decide then and there that we're going to go to try and climb and ski Mount Everest. So we put the expedition together. We knew it was going to take a few years. But by 2003, three years after we were successful on Chishpangma, we found ourselves at the base camp of, of the north side of Everest. And we weren't going to go to the south side because the north side was harder. We were stacking the cards in our favor, and we were just obsessed. I can remember just being so obsessed about proving people wrong. Well, you can probably guess the result of that expedition. We got caught in the storm, didn't get to the top, and when we came off that peak, we were just devastated. And, and for the first time in my life, I could understand how dad could be an Olympian and think my entire ski racing career was a complete waste of talent. We felt like failures. We felt uh, defeated. Uh, it, it was a horrible, horrible ride home. And in that discouraged state of mind, we failed to realize, number one, we attempted Everest pure style, which is a monumental task. But at that time, because so few people were skiing from those altitudes, we failed to realize that we did climb to 25,500 feet and we skied the North Ridge of Everest. And it was only the second time that it had ever been done. And it was the first time an American had ever done it. We, it just completely... It, we were so devastated because we didn't get the medal, we didn't hit the summit, that it just destroyed us. And um, it was, it, it, we didn't realize the accomplishment. I mean, and back then in 2003, if anybody would have skied from 25,500 feet on any peak other than the face of Everest, it would have been headline news. We didn't even, it took us six months to realize what we had accomplished. But that led to my transformation, too, because when I got off that peak, I was discouraged. I, I didn't want to quit, but I was tired from fighting the battle of my ego, but we needed to do something to soothe our wounds. So I found a peak six months later. It was the highest peak in Bolivia called Sahama. It's about 22,000 feet. And I said, Steve and Jim, we got to soothe these wounds. We got to just go and climb up something and ski down it. So we put the expedition together, and I'm telling you, we, we went to Bolivia, we drove out onto the Punta Atacama Desert, and this peak just sticks up out of nowhere, 22,000 feet, it's not buried in a range, and you've got this beautiful desert spread around the bottom of it, no people, it's about 50 degrees at the base, blue sky, I, I mean, th there's nothing more enticing for a ski mountaineer. And when I put that pack on to walk into that peak, those pack straps <laughs> dug into my shoulders, and I wanted to be any place but where I was. Um, Steve and Jim twisted my arm, let's just go. Um, so we got to the base a day, a day later, and I'm looking up at, at, this, at this route, and it's about 1,500 feet of just pure water ice from runoff. And, and it's at about 45 or 50 degrees. And I'm looking at it, and the pack straps are digging in. And I'm going, that is going to be so difficult. That is going to be so dangerous. But on top of it, at that altitude, there just wasn't any snow. I didn't think I was going to get a ski out of it. On, uh, you know, the other, other conflicting issues I had, nobody had ever heard of this peak, even in our world, ski mountaineering. It was an unknown peak, despite being the highest in Bolivia. I didn't see an opportunity, even if I was successful, to prove the naysayers wrong. My obsession was so strong that I didn't see any value in this peak. So I looked at Steve and Jim. They're putting their gear on. They're putting their crampons on and their harnesses. They're getting the rope out. And I said, guys, I'm done. And they didn't say a word. They didn't twist my arm. They just kept putting their gear on. I said, I'm out of here. Turned around, started to walk away. Get about a quarter mile out. I look back and I see these two dots. 
climbing up this steep face. I walk a little bit further. I'm seething that they didn't try and twist my arm <laughs> into, into doing it, but I get a little bit further out and they're a little bit higher. And then the same type of situation happened to me that happened to my dad. I thought, oh my God, what if one of those guys, my twin brother and my best friend, what if one of those guys gets hurt up there or God forbid even killed because I wasn't there to prevent something? So I immediately turned around, went back to that peak, put all my gear on, and I started to climb. And a funny thing happened to me when I got up. I noticed the blue sky. I noticed the beauty of the desert. And I really started to enjoy the climbing for exactly and only what it was. And it energized me. And I, I climbed so fast that I caught up to those guys. And the, the short story is we had a beautiful camp on the peak. We got to the top. We skied down it. And it was a it was a monumental accomplishment because only one other person had ever climbed and skied that peak. It was the first time an American had ever done it. But none of that stuff mattered. I didn't care about what the naysayers thought. I didn't care about the, wh where the peak was. I didn't care about how high it was. I was just experiencing this wellness and this happiness. And, and I knew something happened, but I wasn't quite sure at the time. And I also developed this mantra that I would carry with me for the rest of my career. And it was, from now on, I'm going to be the best damn teammate that I can possibly be.